What are you hoping to possibly see today? So if we had a successful planting, what we're hoping to see today is at least a small cluster of eelgrass with shoots about one to two inches in height right now. There's a lot of environmental factors we have to consider when we're going to check on this site. Once the clams are dropped into the water, there's a potential of them to roll around and not burrow immediately. The tides can push them, wind can push them. They also have predators to deal with. So hopefully at least a significant number of the clams were able to burrow underneath the sediment and then the eelgrass will start growing. I grew up uh, when I was a little kid, I was always inventing things and uh, I had a, my father was a machinist and I learned a little bit about tools from him. I was always creating something. I was always making mischief with whatever I was making. Growing eelgrass from seeds was uh, something that's never really been done before. I did come up with this method to glue these seeds to clams, knowing that clams bury themselves. And then I was able to build a machine to sow in a systematic way on the, on the seafloor, a way to sow these seeds into the ground by using clams to grow in underwater meadow. Worldwide, there's one football field, or one hectare, of eelgrass lost every half hour. This machine could plant five acres in an hour. By doing a large-scale planting, it would have the best success for growing eelgrass. My name is Robert Basil. I invented this machine. I made it from scratch. My name is Steve Schott. I work for Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County's Marine Program. We have been primarily the organization behind a lot of the eelgrass work done in New York over the last 25 plus years. We've planted everywhere from Brooklyn and Jamaica Bay all the way out to Little Narragansett Bay in, in Connecticut, Rhode Island border and everywhere in between. There's always been experimentation on improving. So Rob just basically took a step that no one else had seen yet or thought about. In a lot of cases, the seeds that are put on a bottom can easily be just washed right out of the area that you want them to, or in some cases, overburied. In this case, the clams are actually putting those seeds at the perfect depth and within a few days, which is the really good thing. That right there improves the, the potential for that seed to survive, germinate, and recruit a brand new adult plant. I've been doing eelgrass stuff for EPA pretty much maybe a year after I walked in the door. So I've been doing this for a long time. Long Island Sound has long had issues with eutrophication and nitrogen and water clarity. And those are really the things that are driving and controlling eelgrass distribution and health in the sound. As water quality and water clarity declined as population and industry increased in the surrounding watershed, Eelgrass disappeared in many locations and now pretty much restricted to the eastern third of the sound. We've lost 90% of our eelgrass in the region. It's a unique habitat for our shallow coastal areas that's disappearing. And once it's gone, we don't know that we could bring it back. So of course there's going to be an impact. There's been a cascade effect of losing eelgrass and we've lost other species or they're declined. And that's been documented. Eelgrass grows underwater. It's kind of of a resource that people aren't used to seeing. A lot of our underwater habitats are so underappreciated because they're out of sight, out of mind. You don't realize that they're there. And if you don't realize they're there, you really don't realize that we're losing them and how, you know, how much jeopardy we are of never seeing them again. Fishers Island is home to 98% of New York's eelgrass, so it's a really important stewardship area for us to protect. I am Hannah Vots, project coordinator for the Fishers Island Seagrass Management Coalition. 
The FISM Coalition is a multi-stakeholder group that was founded in 2017 because they realized that seagrass was declining around Fisher's Island. Our main goal is to preserve the eelgrass that we have around Fisher's Island and to sustain efforts to restore eelgrass to the rest of Long Island Sound. So this particular area has a very healthy eelgrass bed. It's got good current, it's got the right substrate. The Atlantic Ocean's right over there. You can see how it passes through towards Watch Hill. I mean, there's thousands of them down here. So what we do is we come in and we anchor up and the divers go in and the divers drop down to the bottom and they go through the eelgrass bed and when they see a reproductive shoot, they, they pick it and it goes into a mesh bag. And then they bring all the eelgrass back up here, all the reproductive shoots with the seeds on them. And they go into a cooler and then one of the divers, Rob, will take these seeds to the uh, Cornell Extension Lab where they have tanks that are bubbling with seawater and he'll put all the seeds in those tanks to preserve them. Today uh, we have assembled uh, our, our live clams from uh, New York State Hatchery and we have collected our eelgrass seeds and cleaned them up and have them ready to do the work we're going to do. And I have this uh, special glue that we're going to use to attach the eelgrass seeds to these clams. These are all the seeds we collected. <clears throat> it might not look like a lot, but there's about 50,000 seeds here. Right on the apex of the shell is where we're gonna put a little glue, we're gonna dip them down onto the seeds, and then we're gonna put them back on another tray. And when we have that tray filled up, We'll put them back in this flowing salt water tank to keep the clams alive and keep the seeds wet. And then they'll stay in this tank until we're ready to transport them and deploy them. So what we're trying to do is test out this method to see how far west in the sound can we go? And then how deep can we go? So we still get enough light to grow the eelgrass and then it'll go in shallower. So here comes the boat. They're gonna go uh, set the buoy on the far side of the permit area, the experimental planting area. And why don't you take a look at that? This last planting we did was 10,000. and We did it in 20 minutes and we did it over a two acre site. We were doing 400 foot runs. They were able to take the clams from the one tray that we were storing them in, in the lab. And we put them on these other trays and we fed the machine with these other trays. And it all worked out. My father had seen Neil Grass back in the 50s when he used to come out from the city before he lived out here. He said there was some out here. Through my research with, with Dealgrass, there's a, there's a fella called uh, Robert Moses. He was a great public work builder. He named Sunken Meadow State Park, Sunken Meadow State Park, because when he came down to the beach and took a look at it, he saw underneath the waves was an underwater meadow. And that was back in the 1930s. And since then, all the eelgrass disappeared, but the name stays. It's Sunken Meadow. It'll be the first time we're, we're getting eelgrass back here in maybe 90 years. Emron Rob, you've just come up. I know you're just like out of breath. Success? Yes, we did find an empty clam with our seeds still glued onto it. So we know it's ours. We know we're in the right spot. And there was a small, small, maybe one and a half inch blade of grass growing off one of the clams. So really hopeful that when we come back later in the year, more of them will have sprouted by then. Our eelgrass restoration method is really an effective nature-based solution because we're using the concept of biomimicry and we're allowing the clams and the eelgrass seeds to do what they naturally do, but work together in a way that benefits the environment. 
So we're really striving to work with our ecosystem and make it work to our advantage to bring back this plant. We have to think about the future as we're thinking about protecting it for now. I think we're, we're happy to be part of the conversations about how to extend the habitat of eelgrass so that we can plan for that future. Not only is climate change killing off the eelgrass, it's also killing off the ecosystem service that e eelgrass provides, which is sequestering carbon. If we can expand all that eelgrass to that level, we're gonna do our part for sequestering carbon and we're just gonna bring the whole sound ecosystem back into balance. And when systems are back in balance, the ability of them to have years of incredible abundance, it just increases. This is gonna take decades and I'll be long dead before we reach what I would consider a, a sustainable steady state on the sound. But there's been a lot of strides in the right direction and this eelgrass project's just one small cog in that overall vision. One thing I can say is I'm optimistic about is that the younger generation is very proactive about preserving their environment. And a lot of people, at least my age, they take it for granted because when I was young, it used to be everywhere and now it's not. It's one of those things that, you know, just to experience it is maybe, maybe something that's lost to future generations. You know, a lot of the people that I started working with, they're now all retired. There's a whole lot of institutional knowledge in this field that we're on the verge of losing. And it's really important for young people to kind of take advantage of that knowledge base while it's still here. In the future, we could have hundreds of these machines, thousands of people helping, and we could turn the tide on the degradation and loss of eelgrass worldwide. And that would be a great achievement.